about hyper and hypoarousal, and we started talking about this yesterday. So here's hyperarousal when we go into that fight, flight, freeze, fawn state um, to mobilize ourselves to deal with the threat. We're going to run away. We're going to fight it. We're going to freeze, but at a high state of tension, so we can take off as soon as it you know, moves or looks away or we're going to fawn and we're gonna move closer to the threat to try to neutralize it that way, right? We're gonna be placating or appeasing or smiley or whatever it is that will reduce that threat. So that's hyperarousal. And down here is hypoarousal, when we kind of collapse or dissociate or check out because we don't wanna be around for whatever is coming next, right? So this white band, as I started talking about, is our window of tolerance where most of us spend most of our time. But remember what we talked about yesterday when I said that our brain gets really good at whatever we ask it to do a lot of. And I used a quick example that I'll spend a couple more seconds on today. If any of you learned to play a sport or you learned a musical instrument, when you first started, you were probably pretty bad, right? And you, let's say any of you played like, I don't know, piano or guitar or something, you had to work really hard to look at like notes on a piece of paper and make your hand do the thing that the notes were telling you to do it took a lot of practice but over time your brain got faster and faster and more powerful at doing what you were asking it to do so if you played an instrument for a few years you probably got to a point where you could just look at the notes on the paper and then play it which is pretty amazing really or even more amazing if you can do something like catch a ball that someone throws to you that if you had to calculate where to put your hand doing math, like, I don't know, I think it's calculus because like the earth is rotating and the ball is rotating and the speed and the wind resistance and blah, blah, blah. But somehow your brain learns how to do it and you can put your hand where the ball is going to be. Y you probably can. I cannot because I'm terrible at that. But with practice, our brains get better and faster and more powerful at doing whatever task we're asking of it this is there's another name for this and we call it learning and it's so intrinsic to human beings that we kind of forget the process that's involved so the good news is that if we do a lot of that we can learn how to catch a baseball or play the guitar the bad news is that if our brain is constantly asked to go into those survival protocols because we are in a very dangerous environment a lot or because we are triggered into our previous trauma, even if that threat is no longer present, then what starts to happen is the brain gets powerful and faster. And eventually you start getting someone who goes up and down into their hyper arousal a lot. And so it the threshold is lower, right? You see how the window of tolerance gets smaller. It takes less and less to knock somebody out of their window of tolerance. They go up into their freak out right or they go down into their shutdown and it takes longer to get them back into their window and with enough time and enough repetition pretty soon you get this so some of you are going to be dealing with people who spend a lot of time out of their window of tolerance it's kind of flipped on its head from the way it's supposed to be hyper and hypo arousal as i've said are survival protocols they are emergency systems they're not meant to be where we live but again if you are exposed to that kind of stress especially early in life especially if it's intense and especially if it's chronic and some of the women you work with will have experienced all three of those elements of traumatic stress then as I said, it's it's sort of reversed and you maybe spend most of your time freaking out or most of your time shut down and collapsed. And I think this is also why we see a lot of misdiagnosis of trauma, because it can look like someone who's angry all the time or oppositional all the time. Or if you have someone who travels, you can see that that sort of roller coaster through those states. If somebody goes through both of those states very quickly, that can look to some people like bipolar disorder. So a little side note here, but to just underline what I talked about yesterday, if you are working with someone and you've been given that diagnosis or they tell you you've gotten a they've gotten a diagnosis of some of the, the um, usual suspects, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, ADHD, 
um, oppositional defiant, you should know that in the mental health world, we know that those are often how trauma gets misdiagnosed. And when you look at this graph and you see that, that up and down in those wide ranges that people can move through very quickly, you start to see why somebody, you know, might look like some of those diagnoses. Um, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. I, if somebody is doing a lot of um, avoidance, remember we talked about that symptom cluster for a PTSD diagnosis. If you're trying to avoid this roller coaster and you're making your world smaller and smaller and smaller, then you look pretty anxious or you look obsessive. Um, if you require exactly the same routine every day to make the world feel manageable and safe for you, to try to stay in your window, which is now very narrow. So the point here is a couple of things. One, just take every diagnosis with a grain of salt, especially if you suspect that trauma is present and maybe if trauma has not been sufficiently diagnosed. Um, and especially for clients, especially for men and especially for clients of color. The next point here is how do we recognize and support someone who spends a lot of time outside of their window and what kind of um, positions can we take? What kind of um, attitudes can we adopt when someone is out of their window that is most helpful for getting them back in? Now, I want to be really clear with you guys. I know that you're not doing trauma therapy. I know that you are not um, doing clinical work with these folks, but that's okay because actually uh, sometimes you guys are going to be among the most important people in someone's life to help them with this. So we'll talk more about that as we get towards the second half. Now, you'll remember that I asked you guys when we started learning about hyper and hypoarousal to think about for you, and I'll go back a little bit because this is probably for most of you what life looks more like this. You spend more time in your window than out of it. But I, I asked you to reflect on when you are out of your window, maybe just a little bit or maybe a lot, what does it feel like in your body? What are the sensations in your body? How do you notice that? What does it, what are, what are the feelings you become aware of? And what are the emotions that come along with that? And maybe some, what are some of the thoughts you have? So you don't have to go into a ton of detail and I don't need everybody, but if a few of you would be willing to put that in the chat section, um, we will talk about that as we uh, go a little further towards our break um, about halfway through this morning. And uh, as we get into the second half, it will become apparent why I asked you guys to reflect on that. So we have people who are maybe out of their window of tolerance. I'm going to go through the next zone. Um, I'm going to skip this, but, but just know that the brain and body evolved over millions of years to have different states of awareness. So um, I guess I'll take a minute to go through this. About 200 million years ago, your brain was able to attend to what was going on around you and make decisions about it. Like, um, you know, you have increased attention if there's something uh, unfamiliar in your environment, but you don't have to go immediately into your survival protocol, right? So you just kind of look and go, oh, what is that? Is that a squirrel? What's going on? And the engagement zone simply means that, uh, again, I won't take you back, but it's sort of another word for that window of tolerance. It's like you're living in a house that feels safe and warm and welcoming. Um, you can have people over, you've got boundaries, you can shut the door, but you can open the door. Trusted people are allowed in, people you don't know have to stay out on the sidewalk. So the engagement zone means that you can interact appropriately with your environment. You can be open to your environment, you can let people get to know you, you can get to know them, you have boundaries. So it's not like anybody can come on in, but you can engage appropriately and effectively with the world. Okay. And that's where we want the women that you are going to be working with to spend most of their time. Unfortunately, it's probably not where most of them spend most of their time. In hyperarousal, this is really just another word for this, um, it's like being in a building where there's a fire. So it doesn't feel safe to be there. All the alarms are going off and people are in that, that red zone, that hyper aroused fight, flight, freeze, fawn state. So they're lashing out, they're aggressive, they're freaking out. Um, they're they're fawning and being overly attentive or overly friendly or overly sexual or whatever it is to try to neutralize the threat and this is where we also see that they may be hyper vigilant so some of your clients may seem as we talked about yesterday 
extra jumpy, extra irritable, but they also might be kind of also um, hyper vigilant and hyper suspicious. So, um, you know, they don't trust people, they don't trust the system, they don't trust that you're there to help them. Some of that is simply learned experience, and it might be a good coping strategy for how they've experienced life up to this point. But some of it may also be that hyper arousal when they're in their red zone. It, it's hard to relax and trust anybody or listen to someone, right? And this is an older version of our brain, about 400 million years old. A uh, tiger's chasing me. Ah! So again, ask yourself how good you would be at completing a task or filling out a form or showing up for a job interview if you were simultaneously being chased by a tiger. It would probably be hard for you to do anything else except try to get away from that tiger. Okay. And then finally, hypo arousal. This is the house is no longer on fire. Everything is shut off. So the house is locked. The utilities are cut off. It's cold and dark inside. There's no engagement with the outside world at all. And this is when you might actually see people so shut down that they can't respond to you um, or where they just seem completely absent or vacant or checked out. There's there's a safety in shutting out the world, but it's at a high price because you can't interact with anybody and you also can't protect, you can't take any measures to protect yourself. So some of our clients who seem especially vulnerable to um, exploitation or to what I just call basically the bad boyfriends, you know what I mean, right? The men who come in and out of their lives and who are incredibly dangerous or destructive. If you're wondering why a woman's um, alarm system didn't go off at some kind of sketchy behavior, it may be because of this. If she spends a lot of time shut down, she's not taking in information and she can't take action to protect herself, right? So, or set a boundary or whatever it is. Um, this is an even older version of our brain. And this is the tiger lives at my house now. And we, we you guys will work with many women who grew up with tigers in their house or who are very used to a succession of boyfriends or partners or whatever who are dangerous, who are a tiger. And what would you do if there was a tiger in your home? You'd probably try to make yourself very small and very quiet, right? So that can look like apathy. That can look like, I don't care about what you're telling me or the efforts you're making to help me. I don't care about parenting my child or, um, you know, what, or protecting my child from the bad boyfriend. Again, it, this is not to excuse any behaviors or choices that women make. It's simply to say, if this is the brain state you spend a lot of time in, it's really hard to do anything proactive. And I think why it's so valuable and important that you guys are learning about this is that I think it also really helps um moderate your frustration or the frustration of staff if you're a supervisor um in that it's not that this person doesn't care it's not that this person is indifferent to you it's that they're shut down to protect themselves on a very primeval ancient like you know amoeba level this is when we can't do anything else we kind of we just check out right it's it's a it's a very primitive um reaction when nothing else is going to work or when it feels like nothing else is going to work um okay so uh yeah this is something i've already talked about but if you are interested in trauma you may have heard the name bruce perry bruce perry works a lot with childhood trauma so if any of you are going to be focusing with the children of the woman that you're help the women you're helping or if you've worked with kids this may be a name that's familiar to you or a name that you want to check out and uh, Bruce Perry has said that the state becomes a, a trait. Don't worry about the brainstem stuff. That's part of a larger trauma training. But suffice it to say that when you spend a lot of time in those states, it kind of starts to look like your whole personality. You know, this is this is how people perceive you. This is how you may perceive yourself or what you believe about yourself. Um, and this can lead to all kinds of problems in terms of how people experience you. Um, he said another really important thing that we're going to talk about in a second. So this is a slide that I've adapted from the work of a therapist named Deb Dana. And I sometimes use this as a worksheet with my clients in my 
private practice when we're talking about trauma and you know learning to recognize and work with their own brain states so when i asked you guys what are you aware of when you are in that red zone or in that blue zone this is just another way to organize that so sensations what are you feeling in your body is your heart fluttering is your face flushed are your hands shaky does you know do you feel sick to your stomach what's going on what what emotions what feelings are you having scared angry sad whatever numb and what kind of thoughts are you having so this is just another way to organize this and you guys are i don't think this is in your manual but i and don't worry about the vagal stuff again that's part of a larger trauma training um for what we're doing this time around with you guys but um the engagement zone the hyper arousal the hypo arousal you guys are pretty familiar with that now so you're welcome to think about this and maybe even jot this down or use this i i strongly encourage you to continue observing this about yourself. The more you observe, the more you pay attention, the more you will see. And it's really important, as we'll discover a little bit later in the training today, that we know where we are. A lot of times when I do a trauma training, people expect that we're going to be focusing on their clients. And we have been. But when you're getting ready to really work skillfully with people who are in various states of traumatic stress, we have to start with ourselves. We have to know where we are. And that's what the second half of today will largely be about, is working with where we are, how we are feeling, because we have our own histories, we have our own stresses, and the stuff that our clients do can sometimes either trigger our own you know, history, or it, it, it can make us really angry, or really scared, or really freaked out, or really frustrated, or um, feeling really powerless or whatever that is. So we have these experiences too. And this is just another way of thinking about how we observe these, how we organize these, how we understand these for ourselves. Okay, as I said, another word from Bruce Perry. And Bruce Perry said something that I think is relevant to every single audience I've ever talked to, whether that's adults or kids, or people who are neurotypical or people who are neurodiverse or whatever it is. He said, people usually want to teach other people from the top down, but the brain actually works from the bottom up. So what is he talking about there? What he's talking about is the process that we've been putting together in our conversation over the past two days. And that is how the brain and body react together to keep you safe. Okay, so I've mentioned a couple of times, I, I think mostly yesterday, that feelings are in the body. And what I mean by that is that we experience our emotions and we process our reactions to a threat all the way through our bodies. It's not just a thought that we have, right? If you see something like, um, uh, I don't know, let's say a dog is off the leash in the park and you're like, oh, that dog, I don't, I'm not going to go that way. I'm going to go the other way because that dog looks like it might not be under control. Okay. That's a thought that you're having, but long before you had that thought or made that decision, your brain and body reacted to the sound of the snarling and the, the sight of the dog racing around. Okay. I, I will talk about vagal theory just a little bit to orient you guys to what I'm saying here. So the vagus nerve is one of the 12 nerves in your brain, and it splits off into two branches, but it runs right down the center of your body. One half splits down and runs down your back. The other half comes down around the front and it goes through your vocal cord. I don't think you guys can see me, but it attaches to your heart and your lungs and your diaphragm. So the front part comes down to about your diaphragm, about midway down your, your torso. And then the other one, the one in the back, wraps around to your bladder and bowels. So whichever part of the nerve you're talking about, it goes straight through you, right down the center of your core, okay? And the vagus nerve has about 20% of its activity taking information from your brain, your thinky thought brain, down to your body. So for example, if you are a little worried about something, a little anxious, like I'm always a little nervous before I do a training. So my brain can talk to my body and go, you know what, this is gonna be fine. You practice this, your slides are ready, it's gonna go fine. And I can sort of calm myself down. Most of you guys are probably pretty good at that. 
but that's only 20% of the activity on that nerve complex. The other 80% goes from your body up to your brain. And if any of you experience anxiety or maybe even panic attacks, what you may have noticed is that if you're a little bit anxious, you can kind of talk yourself down. But if you're very anxious, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter how much you tell yourself or someone else tells you, what's the big deal? You don't need to worry about it. Your body's still freaking out, right? And it takes a long, long time for your brain to relax and come back down into your window of tolerance. So if you think about it from an activity perspective, a traffic perspective, I want you guys to imagine a highway like 70 or 71. And imagine on one side, there's four lanes of traffic all going in one direction. And on the other side, there's a bike lane and that's it. So when we look at the traffic going from your brain to your body or your body to your brain, the body to the brain is like four lanes of highway traffic. And the brain talking to the body is, is just like a, you know, some, someone on a scooter, right? That's, that's all they've got. So when Perry says the brain actually works from the bottom up, what he means is our brain reacts to something either in our environment we see or hear or smell or whatever something around us or sometimes it notices something going on inside of us so another example might be if you're a coffee drinker and you accidentally drink a little too much coffee your heart probably goes faster than you're used to and you may think that you're scared or or anxious about something you're not there's nothing going on it's just that your heart sped up but what's happening is your body is sending 80% of that traffic up to your brain going, hey, our heart's going really fast. And your brain goes, oh, something bad must be going on. I must be anxious. Nope, that's not what's happening. You just sped up your heart. That's all. So 80% from your body to your brain, you're, you react through anything coming in through your sensory networks in your body or around you the brain sets off that alarm system remember we talked about the amygdala and other structures in the brain setting off the alarm so you either go up into that red zone that fight flight freeze fawn or you go down into the blue zone hypoarousal you you check out you feel spacey you know you maybe even sort of collapse in on yourself a little bit and your brain is watching all of this and going, oh my goodness, something really terrible must be going on. And so you, it sort of creates this loop. In order to get yourself safe, your brain will divert energy to where it's most needed. So once we've started that loop that there's something scary happening or something dangerous, your brain will then kind of go to the next step, which is sort of shutting down your thinking. In my book, if you're interested, I talk a lot more about the some of the most recent ways of thinking about and, and understanding how the brain works. And so what I'm going to tell you is a little bit older, not quite out of date, but not quite completely the way brain scientists on the cutting edge of research are thinking about the brain. But for our purposes today, this will be enough. I want you guys all to take your right hand and cross your thumb across your palm and then lightly wrap your fingers around your thumb. This is a reasonably accurate way to think about the different regions of the brain. So we can split it up into three areas. There's the sort of the bottom of your brain, the, that flat bottom of the brain, and then the little like cauliflower stalk where it attaches to your spinal column. So let's say your arm is your spinal column. This bottom part of the brain is sometimes referred to as the brainstem. It really talks about the whole region. And the brainstem is largely involved with a lot of the automatic functioning of your body. So most of you right now are not sitting here um, reminding yourself how to breathe. You know, interestingly, Bridget, when you started diving, you maybe had to actually think about how you were breathing. But most of us don't have to do that because the brainstem is just kind of running it automatically. Even when you're asleep, you keep breathing. Um, heart rate, blood pressure, digestion, elimination, um, temperature regulation, sexual arousal, all of that stuff tends to be centered in that region of the brain. So it's kind of an automatic pilot, right? And then if you look back at your little hand brain here and you open your hand, this region where your thumb is, sort of the middle of the brain, kind of corresponds to the limbic system. You've probably heard about the limbic system because it's very involved with a lot of different things happening between the body and the mind. So regulating and understanding emotion, um, 
memory, learning, a lot of stuff is involved with the limbic system. But this is also where we have the amygdala. And the amygdala, as I've referenced earlier, um, so if you look at your thumbnail, okay, where your thumb would be in your, your, in your fist, imagine that you have two little almond-shaped freckles at the bottom corners of your thumbnail. That would roughly correspond to where your amygdala is in your brain. And the amygdala is involved with constantly scanning the environment in, outside and inside, all right? And asking the question, am I safe? Are things okay? Can I stay in my window? What's going on, right? And again, this is a constant like radar system, if you will. You are not consciously aware of it most of the time, but it is constantly looking around, making sure everything is okay. And so, as I said, it takes information, not just from your environment, but also from inside your body. When your heart speeds up because you had a little too much coffee, your amygdala kind of checks that out and goes, wait a second, what? why, why is the heart going faster? What's going on? Am I scared? Am I worried about this meeting coming up? Oh, no, wait, I just had too much coffee today. Okay. That process that you go through is triggered by the amygdala. Okay. The amygdala, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, if you glance down at the ground and you see a snake and you jump away from it, the amygdala sees snake and makes you jump. Then you take a second look and your thinking brain goes, wait a minute. That snake seems to have a lot of leaves coming out of it. Hmm. I think it's a stick. I think I don't need to be afraid of that snake because it's actually a stick. That um, closer look and looking at detail and putting things in context, that requires the thinking brain. Okay, so that if we go back to our hand brain, then the back of your hand and then wrapping up across your fingers down to your fingernails. This is sort of that thin layer of cells that are at the top of your brain and kind of encase it. And that is often referred to as the cortex. And the cortex is the most recent part of the brain to develop in mammals and humans. And it does a lot of what we think of as our most sophisticated brain function. So thinking, talking, logic, um, connecting cause and event or cause and effect, uh, looking into the future, planning, stuff like that is largely happening in the cortex, especially towards the front of your brain. Okay. So most of the time when you are in your window of tolerance, you're in that middle zone or the engagement zone, you can interact with the world and let it interact with you. Then all three regions of your brain are connected to each other and talking to each other and running things smoothly. So a common um, example people will use for this would be like driving your car. The rear wheels and the front wheels and the gas pedal and the brakes and the electric system and the steering wheel are all working in sync and talking with each other and working in balance. That's how we function most of the time, how we want to be functioning. However, when the survival protocols kick in, when we get knocked up into our red zone or knocked down into our blue zone and we go to that emergency state, then a lot of the activity in the thinking brain shuts down. In fact, if for some reason um, I were wearing a, and, you know, I had one of those weird like swim caps on and all the wires coming out and they were measuring my brain activity while I got scared, then what we would see is that the middle and lower parts of my brain would light up like a Christmas tree. There's a lot of activity going on down there, relatively inactive in the thinking brain. And from a survival perspective, that totally makes sense, right? Your brain is really, really, really efficient and very interested in protecting you. Very, very interested, very motivated for survival. If I'm, imagine literally trying to run away from a tiger, then I don't need to know how to do long division. I just need to be able to go tigers that way. I need to run that way. And that's it. And that's where all of the energy goes. If you think about where um, blood flow goes in the body, if we're under attack or we're under threat, if you, when people um, say that their hands feel clammy or they went cold, what's actually happening is that there's, um, there's a constriction of your blood vessels and the blood is being flooded to your, your central organs to protect them and to your major, your major muscle groups to get away. But your skin may feel tingly or numb because there's not a lot of blood flow there. 
So your brain and body react as one to go to emergency systems and the non-essential stuff gets shut off. Another example might be if you're in a building where there is a fire or a fire drill, sometimes they shut off most of the lights and they just have the emergency lights on, partly so you can see them to get out because you're not thinking very clearly, right? Because this is shut off, but also because they want to save energy in the building and divert it to where it is most needed. Okay, so when Perry says the brain actually works from the bottom up, what he's saying is the brain, if there's anything that registers with our brains as potentially threatening, the top of the brain, so to speak, kind of isn't working so well. And it's all about helping the middle and bottom part of our brain shut down the emergency protocol, bring all the systems back online, turn all the lights back on and get everything working in sync again. Okay. Now let's talk about the first part. People usually want to teach other people from the top down with this top down, bottom up kind of model of the brain. This starts to make a little more sense. What he means here is that when people are under stress or um, not reacting appropriately or uh, freaking everybody out, for lack of a better word. Usually what we try to do, the people around that person, is we try to talk to them and explain why what they're doing is wrong, <laughs> right? We try to use logic. So for example, um, if you said to a woman who is uh, dysregulated, who is not in her window of tolerance, she's in the red zone or the blue zone, and she's freaking out or she shut down. And you try to explain things like, hey, if you don't go to this job interview, then you're not going to have this job and you won't make your rent payment and blah, 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 blah. All of that is completely correct. But if her brain is in survival mode, it really can't process what you're asking her to think about. The ability to think about what we want in the future, or I need to do this unpleasant thing now to get this thing I want later, that's actually pretty sophisticated thinking. And maybe when she's calm and when she's in her window of tolerance, she can do that okay. But when she's panicking or shut down, nope. In fact, our brain will so dramatically shut some of that stuff down that when someone is very terrified, they may not be able to use language at all. They may be able to scream, but they may not be able to put words into sentences. And if you've ever worked, uh, especially with um, kids or teenagers or adults with disabilities, it is something that we say to people all the time, right? You need to use your words, Ashley. Well, that's great. That's again, great advice, unless Ashley's not in her window of tolerance. If she is very dysregulated, she's very high into the red zone or the blue zone, the language center of her brain may be relatively inactive. In other words, maybe she can't. Just like my professor could scream the word incoming because it was kind of trained into his brain, but while he was screaming in the movie theater, he probably couldn't have explained to anyone what was going on, okay? So when we are talking to somebody who is dysregulated, who, so we, we talk about the brain being regulated when all the parts are functioning together in sync and everything is in balance. When someone is, out of their zone into one of those emergency states that's dysregulated. Some of the parts are working overtime and some are relatively inactive, okay? Dysregulated. When someone is very dysregulated, asking them to think about consequences or follow complex instructions or explain what's going on with them inside may be very difficult, if not impossible for them. And remember, some of the women you work with may already have some cognitive issues. So um, I mentioned this yesterday and Tamika, I saw you nodding at this, that, that some of the folks you guys are gonna be working with may have borderline intellectual functioning, right? They probably don't qualify for lots of DD support, but they may qualify for some, or they're, they're sort of in that range where they kind of don't quite qualify, but you sort of wish they could. Um, or they've, their brain has been so used to being so dysregulated from early severe or chronic trauma that they spend most of their time in that red zone or most of the time in that blue zone. And what that means is their, their logical thinking is not so great to begin with on their best day, making decisions and thinking about the future and, and you know figuring out if I want this, I need to do that. 
And th that's not a slam on them. And it doesn't have anything to do with intelligence. It just means that if they have not had a lot of activity consistently in that thinky thought front part of their brain in at the cortex level, the brain's not so quick at that. It's not so strong at that. So you may be working with women who already struggle with putting things into language or thinking about the future or you know understanding consequences or whatever and then when they're triggered and their brain becomes dysregulated they go into that survival state it's even harder so what perry is saying here is you essentially you've got to get the brain regulated before you can ask them to do any of that higher function stuff another way to say it if you want to come back into your office and get some work done you've got to stop the fire alarm you're not going to be able to do anything if the fire alarm is still going off you've got to quiet that down you've got to shut that off before you can do any of this other um, more sophisticated more complex stuff so hopefully that makes sense to everybody um what we will then embark on for the rest of our time is how do we do that what is it that people need from us so that they can begin to come back into their window of tolerance well we've talked about how trauma is at its heart reacting to a threat there is something either happening right now or something that's happened in the past that we're reliving either way it doesn't really matter very much um, that is making us feel under threat we are not safe and as we talked about from the very beginning with that story of my professor in the movie theater we're not in control of ourselves and again in control does not mean i am now the boss of everyone it means i'm not in control of myself as we've talked about the brain a little more today i think there's a we have a deeper understanding that what i mean literally is that that front part of the brain which also does things like impulse control and decision making is relatively inactive when we are triggered into our trauma so the part that can say i should not slap this cop i should not throw this chair in the classroom i should not storm off this job and quit that part of the brain isn't they can't access it very well right they are dysregulated that part of the brain's not online and so they are literally not in control of what they are doing because they can't think about what they're doing and make conscious choices if you can't choose what you're doing at any given moment then it's not behavior it's a reaction and you're not in control of yourself we want people to get regulated we want them back into that window of tolerance so that the decision making thinking part of the brain can function and then they can be in control of themselves then they can make choices about what they want to do next right so someone who is triggered into their trauma is unsafe and out of control that's a pretty simple way to define it, I think. And in fact, those of you who raised your hand who have had some trauma-informed care training, if you look at a lot of those models, like from SAMHSA or I think uh, the sanctuary model or whatever, um, they often kind of have those two pillars. So most of the model is talking about how to help people feel safe and how to help people be empowered, how to help them have choices. My guess is a lot of what your program is going to do focuses on those two things. How do we get these moms into safe housing and in safe environments? And how do we help them feel empowered to make choices for themselves and their babies, right? How do we help them feel empowered in their own lives? Excellent. What trauma responsive care has done, the model that we created, just creates a bridge between those two things, okay? We say that people, the, the fastest way to make those two things happen, and it's kind of a two-way street really, is to help them feel connected. And why do I say that? Why, what, where did I come up with that? Well, in order to talk about that, we're going to spend um, sort of this last section before we take our break somewhere around the hour, um, talking about how fear works in our brains. You guys may remember yesterday that I very quickly mentioned that among other neurotransmitters, what happens in our brain when the amygdala sees or feels or hears or smells something and goes, oh, oh no, this is dangerous, whatever that is, our brain starts releasing cortisol and norepinephrine. There, there are other transmitters involved as well, but those are the chemicals that are released in your brain. And the brain works all on an electrochemical level, right? Where chemicals are, what they're doing, is how everything in your brain functions. 
So your brain starts pumping out cortisol and norepinephrine that signals the release of adrenaline from the adrenal glands on top of your kidneys. We're back on that central axis, right? And this happens in fractions of a second. You're not aware of the stages of this process. It seems to happen all at once, but actually there are steps involved. Your body starts being flooded with adrenaline and cortisol. Cortisol is the stress chemical. And remember we talked yesterday about if there's a lot of adrenaline in your system, there's so much of it that it'll make your, your muscle fibers start twitching kind of randomly, which is why it can feel, you can feel sort of shaky and you know, I can't quite control my movement. All of that is an incredibly powerful impulse, like signaled through your body to get you safe. You're gonna use that adrenaline to fight or run away. Adrenaline actually um, uh, dampens your ability to feel pain, which is why if you've ever, I hope this hasn't happened to you, but if you've ever been in like, I don't know, a bike accident or a car crash or something like that, you may notice that you really didn't feel pain at first. That's because adrenaline is a natural analgesic, keeps you from feeling pain. It just wants you to do whatever you need to do, crawl out of that crushed car, and it doesn't matter if you get scraped up to get out, right? Okay. So going back to the brain, norepinephrine and cortisol, we could say that that is the on switch for fear in the brain. Your brain, I saw a number recently about how many functions your brain will do throughout your lifetime, how many little operations. And the number was like 11 dejillion. I it, it was such a big number, I could not understand it. So your brain will do millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of things for you throughout your lifetime. And your brain is unbelievably sophisticated and complex. We are still just kind of grappling with how we think it might actually work. Okay. So on one hand, your brain is unbelievably complicated, but on the other hand, it's pretty simple. It's organized on a few very simple principles. And one of them, you might want to write this down. So, you know, get ready. One principle is on and off, just like a light switch, right? Your brain has to have a way of starting something and it has to have a way to stop that from happening. When I lift my cup of coffee, I have to start the motion to lift my hand. If I'm scratching my nose, for example, and my brain doesn't have a way to stop that motion, I'm going to keep scratching until my nose falls off. And in fact, if, you, um, if you've ever known or worked with people with some neurological problems like Parkinson's, Parkinson's, among other things, interferes with the on and off switch. So people with Parkinson's may have a hard time moving. They, they have a hard time starting the movement. But once they start, they have a hard time stopping it or the movement can be kind of random. So on and off. And if we know what the on switch for fear is, if the on switch chemically is norepinephrine and cortisol, then there has to be an off switch. And there is. The off switch is, among other chemicals, nor, um, dopamine and serotonin. You've probably heard of both of those things a lot. We've we, they, we talk a lot about them in terms of mood regulation. A lot of um, depression medication is based on serotonin levels in the brain. A couple are based on other ones. But um, dopamine is very involved with reward and pleasure. And also that helps us with learning and memory, but that's a conversation for another day. So dopamine and serotonin, they're involved in a lot of things. So what happens if your brain starts releasing dopamine and serotonin instead of the norepinephrine and cortisol? Well, dopamine and serotonin actually break down those chemicals, right? It's like putting soap into grease and the soap starts breaking it up. That's what dopamine and serotonin do. Fun fact. So why am I taking you through the details of this neurology because if we want the brain to stop signaling danger 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 or to go back to our metaphor if we want to turn off the fire alarm then we have to switch what's going on in the brain we have to find the off switch if we can get someone's brain to start releasing dopamine and serotonin that's the off switch it'll start getting rid of the fear chemicals in the brain that will stop sending the signal to the kidneys the kidneys will the 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 adrenal glands on the kidneys will stop flooding us with adrenaline and we can start to come back into our window of tolerance well how do we get brains to release dopamine and serotonin literally anything human beings take pleasure from involves those two chemicals so um drugs sex food especially comfort food 
um, gambling, shopping, little online games where you get little bells and whistles and rewards and, you know, things like that. All of those things cause our brains to release dopamine and serotonin. And I've been doing this training for a long time, but I got a chance to witness this firsthand and observe it in myself during the pandemic. What did we all do during the pandemic? Um, except for a few deranged individuals that use the time to, you know, work out every day and get fit. And I really don't understand that kind of person. Most of us spent a lot of time on the couch, comfy, snuggled up, maybe with somebody we love, binge watching. There's a reason why we use the word binge, right? It's a little bit automatic and compulsive, a little bit out of our control. Binge watching, I don't know what, Parks and Rec for me or The Office or whatever you liked. And we ate comfort food. There's a reason why a lot of us gained weight. Now, weight is complex and it also involves the stress chemicals, but some of it is that nobody ever calls kale salad comfort food, right? We were eating chips and donuts and macaroni and cheese. It has, those foods have a lot of fats and sugars, which our brain really likes, and it releases dopamine and serotonin. So I think very few of us were sitting around going, how do I shift the chemical tide of neurotransmitters? I know, but we were thinking, what makes me feel better? And those are the things that make us feel better. So anything we can do that helps someone's brain release those chemicals will help to shut off the alarm system and help them to start come back into their window of tolerance. But of all the things I mentioned, one of the fastest and most powerful ways to get a human brain to start releasing dopamine and serotonin is a, a warm, friendly, loving connection with another human being who values them. That's it. The other stuff, great too. But some of our most powerful rewards, this is also a quote from Bruce Perry, come from close connections with other human beings. That's what we crave the most, right? So if we want to quickly help someone re-regulate and get their brain back online and be able to start doing the thinking and logic and impulse control um, that we want them to be able to do, then helping them to feel connected is one of the quickest, most powerful ways to do that. Now, if you've you know known someone for 30 years and they're very best friends with you, then that's a really powerful connection. But if you think about times in your life where um, you've been under stress or you've undergone a crisis. Think about how the way someone talked to you, even if it was a nurse at your doctor's office or an EMT or your supervisor at work, when someone talks to us in a way that's kind and gentle and warm, and if they let us know that they care about us and that they're here to help, that alone can be enough to start shifting the brain chemistry. That alone can start to help us feel not so unsafe, not so out of control to help us feel not so alone with what we're dealing with and things start to calm down, right? So that presence that we offer people, even if we haven't known them very long, can sometimes be a really powerful way to shift the function in their brain and to get their brain going towards what we want back into their window of tolerance, okay? Um, there's another ancient way to say this that I really love. And I, I kind of made this connection as I was learning about tra trauma and putting this model together. Um, my favorite verse in the Bible is from the book of John. Perfect love casteth out suffering, it uh, casteth out fear. Perfect love casteth out fear. In other words, fear can't stick around when love is present. Or if you like, even more simply, Love is stronger than fear. And when you look at the brain chemistry, that happens to be exactly neurologically correct. The chemicals of love and connection are stronger than the chemicals of fear and panic. There you go. So as we spend the rest of our time together, and we'll get ready to take our break in a moment, we will be talking about how do we best help people to experience that from us. In order for someone to feel that sense of connection and safety with us, we have to find a way to feel safe, connected, and in control within ourselves. If we go back for a second to Bruce Perry, when he says people usually want to teach other people from the top down, but the brain actually works from the bottom up, this lines up perfectly with what he's saying. When we help someone to feel safe, connected, and in control, 
the alarm systems of the brain are calming down and we can get the thinking brain online and we really are working bottom up. And you'll notice if I go all the way back to what I asked you guys, your, your question for yesterday and today, what do you, I did it in this order. What do you notice in your body? What emotions are you aware of? And what thoughts are you aware of? Because I want to do it in the same order. When I talk with my clients, we do everything in that order. What are you noticing in your body? What emotions are you conscious of? And what are your thoughts? What are you thinking about? Okay, so bottom up. And if we ask ourselves, well, who do we need to do this with? Right? You may have some clients who either you, you have paperwork on them or their medical records or whatever, and you know that they've been diagnosed with trauma or PTSD. Some of them may self-report. I think as a society, we're more aware of trauma now. So some people may be, may be able to tell you, I have tons of trauma, buckets and buckets of trauma. And you'd be like, okay, cool. Thanks for letting me know. But there are a lot of people where you're not going to know that because they've never been properly diagnosed with it. Maybe they've never gotten any support for their mental health at all. Or maybe it was never reported. They never shared with anyone their trauma history. Maybe they never defined it as trauma. It was just normal life to them. And there's an even bigger problem than identifying the big T traumas that we might miss. And that's little t. When we start doing this training with organizations or, or counties or states or whatever, people will often say, oh my gosh, we should do more trauma screening. And we always say the same thing. We're always like, yeah, you definitely should do that. That would be a great thing to do. But you will still miss people. Partly because of the problems with, with, with um, reporting and diagnosing large big T trauma. But the bigger problem is little t. I have seen multiple instruments for different populations for measuring or counting how many big T traumas someone has experienced in their life. I've never seen one that measures little t. What do microaggressions add up to if someone's dealing with racism and oppression and marginalization? How do we count that every day? How do we count the number of times someone feels devalued or misunderstood or ignored? Um, how many times did they feel that they failed at something? Maybe someday someone will create that instrument, but I've never seen it. And depending on what population you talk about, some vulnerable populations, when you put those two kinds of trauma together, you're talking about more than 90%. We already know the trauma rates for the women that you will be serving are probably, I would guess if you ask me to, probably somewhere in that neighborhood as well. And when you're talking about 70, 80, 90%, for my money, you're kind of talking about everybody. So, who needs to feel safe, connected, and in control? For your group of folks, it's everybody. And I would add some of the staff that you uh, hire and supervise probably have some similar levels of trauma. So when Kevin does trainings, he usually talks about how the entire agency can do this for everyone, the people they serve, the people they employ, everybody. For our training, we're going to talk about the people that you serve, your client base you need to treat everyone this way and the simplest way to think about it is universal precautions my guess is for this job or other jobs you've had you had to take first aid training right and what were you taught you were taught that there are some kinds of diseases especially things like blood-borne pathogens like hiv or hepatitis that you can get from being in contact with someone's blood so if i were one of your ladies in your program or a kid and i got a cut you would probably not say my guess is that rachel would not be like oh wait i think i've got a tissue somewhere here uh, here uh, let's clean it. i'll just put that back in my pocket okay first of all because that's gross but secondly because she's had training in universal precautions so if i have a cut if i'm a woman in her program and i'm bleeding or whatever she would stop to put on gloves there's probably some first aid kit around somewhere hopefully and the reason she would do that is that you can't just look at me and tell if i'm sick or not I could very easily have one of those viruses and not, I might not know, you wouldn't know. So would Rachel take a blood sample and say, hang on one sec, Lara, I'm gonna run this over to the lab. It'll be back in about two weeks and then I can put that Band-Aid on you. No, I will have bled out by then. That's totally impractical. Does she say, eh, you look okay. I'm gonna guess that you're fine and go ahead and not protect herself? No, she doesn't do that either. Because if she's wrong and I'm not okay, it could be catastrophic for her. It could cost her her life, right? So 
Universal precautions are so simple and brilliant, it's easy to miss them because they're so simple. It just says this, treat everyone as if they are sick in a way that they could give you something, right? We all learned a whole new version of universal precautions with masking. I don't know if you've got COVID. I don't know if I've got COVID. We're going to wear masks to protect ourselves as if one of us is sick or I'm going to put on gloves and I'm going to use a bleach solution or whatever to keep me safe from catching anything from your blood. I'm going to treat you as if you're sick. Now, does that mean that you're going to give me six weeks of antiviral injections without knowing if I have a virus or not? No, that's also totally impractical and way too invasive and could do me real harm, right? Putting on gloves or wearing a mask doesn't cost anything. It costs like fractions of a penny and it doesn't hurt me. And if you're wrong and I wasn't sick and you never needed to do any of that stuff, no big deal, right? It costs you almost nothing. If you guess that I'm okay and I'm not, it could cost you everything. So the smart bet is to treat everyone as if. And what you will do with the women, and hopefully also if you're working with people who ha have children, what you'll do with the women and children in your program is you will treat every single one of them as if they need to feel safe and connected and in control before you ask them to do anything else any crisis intervention or problem solving or goal setting or whatever it is, they need to feel safe, connected and in control bottom up before you ask anything else of them. And that way, as a universal precaution, if you treat everyone that way, then you'll catch the ones that you would otherwise have missed. And for the few women that have no traumatic stress in their lives whatsoever, great. Who doesn't want to feel safe, connected and in control? No one ever says, no, I'd like to feel terrified and isolated and powerless. Where, where can I sign up for that program? Nobody wants that. So when we come back from our break, we're going to talk about what, how we can equip ourselves to be in the best position to help people feel safe, connected, and in control. So let me pause here. I'm going to pause the share and let's go into the chat section and see what people wrote. Um, okay, so Jessica shared that her hearing changes almost amplified but muffled. I've heard people um, share that before, Jessica. That's really interesting. Bridget said she knows his negative thinking, perseverating on unfamiliar situations. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm really good at that, not to brag. Um, avoidance of uncomfortable situations for sure. Rachel says she stops taking in information and she stops talking. Um, and Kevin helpfully shared that Bible verse with us because he has a degree in theology which you may not have known. So um, great, everybody. Those are perfect examples of what I'm talking about. I'd like you to continue sort of reflecting on that as we've gained a little more information. What are the symptoms or symptoms? What are the sensations, feelings, and thoughts that you notice in yourself? And we will come back with that when we come back from our break in 10 minutes as we start talking about the calmer skills. So let's see what time it is here. Um, I'm going to stop the share for a second so I can see. It is 10.06. So let's come back at 10.16. Everyone take 10 minutes, walk around, get some water, move your body, and we will pick up with that when I see you guys. So see you in 10 minutes, everybody. Mm -hmm. 